Hello and welcome to another Spring Docs Q&A. My name is Camilia Shofani and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Events here at IDA. I'm a light-skinned Mexican-Palestinian woman with dark curly hair, dark eyes, and I'm wearing a black zip-up sweater. I want to thank our media sponsors, Variety and KCRW for sponsoring our Spring Docs Showcase. Tonight we have a conversation uh, between film critic Allison Wilmore and director Ryan White, whose series Pamela, A Love Story is currently streaming on Netflix. For more info on our current lineup, please visit www.documentary.org forward slash Spring Docs. Before we start, I'd like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino Tongva and Chumash peoples as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land of water and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. Um, thank you, Andrea Lust, for ASL interpreting this discussion. And with that, I will pass it over to Allison. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Wilmore. I am a film critic at New York Magazine. Uh, I am wearing a dark blue top and I'm sitting against a brick background. And it is my pleasure to be here talking with Ryan White, the director of Pamela, A Love Story. Thank you, Allison. My name is Ryan White. I'm wearing a blue denim top and I'm in front of a, a gray kitchen. But thank you for taking the time, Allison. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Um, it feels like this documentary offers just such a wealth of topics with regard to image and celebrity and who gets to control someone's uh, sexuality um, and, and monetize it. Um, but I, I wanted to start first because uh, you've, you've mentioned this in, in different interviews that you've done. Um, you know, your filmmaking career has touched on this whole spectrum of topics and different formats. The Case Against Eight is about the battle to overturn California's ban on gay marriage. The Keepers is a true crime docuseries. And you have made films about kind of prominent public figures like Serena Williams, Dr. Ruth, uh, but you've also said that you've been wary when approached about celebrity doc projects, uh, which there do seem to be more now, maybe than ever before. Um, what for you as a filmmaker makes you think twice when you're approached about the idea of a celeb driven project? Yeah, I think we drive our agents crazy, but we spend a lot of our time saying no to celebrity documentary projects. It's not like I have anything against celebrities. It's more um, the amount of people that come with those projects where, you know, I don't think on face value, a celebrity story is any more interesting than a non-celebrity. So uh, there has to be something pretty special fundamentally um, with that person's story. But when there's a team of people around the person, like publicists and managers and agents that want something out of the documentary, it can be a real turnoff from the beginning. And so I've been in some pretty, I wouldn't say ugly situations, but some pretty awkward situations, especially um, a few years ago when the celeb doc was a little bit more new, or at least I was a little more green where, you know, I've actually sat down with a celebrity with or without their team and then ended up in the position where I didn't want to make it. And then you feel like you're evaluating someone's life worth, you know, by, by declining the documentary and it's led to some pretty uncomfortable positions. So at this point in my career, I'm even very careful to even end up in a situation face to face um, with a celebrity. Like I like to do a lot of research and have a lot of understanding of what the goals of that project are before I even end up in the first conversation. Um, and Pamela, Pamela was a unique one. And I wouldn't have thought she was like, I would have thought Pamela for how famous she is, and especially how famous she is in my mind, because, you know, I'm born in the early 80s, 81. So like when I'm 15, 16, 17, Pamela is the most famous person in the world to me. Um, and then I think she kind of disappeared from my consciousness as I became an adult and entered the documentary film world, but I just assumed she was still that larger than life iconic figure and still 
you know, really out there trying to be famous and wealthy. Um, and so that came with all these preconceived notions for me of who Pamela Anderson would be. And so when it was first pitched to me, which was through Josh Braun, um, the sales agent, Julia Nottingham, our producer, I kind of said, no, thank you at the beginning, just based on pure judgment on my part. Um, and then I met with Pamela's son, Brandon, they talked me into having a lunch with him. And it was at that lunch that everything he was telling me about his mom was incredibly surprising. I like, I didn't even know she was Canadian, um, much less that she had moved back to this small island, um, you know, well, big island, but small town uh, where she grew up and had married a local. And so everything he was saying was just chiseling away at all of these preconceived notions. Uh, and he talked me into having a Zoom conversation with her. So I was in this very kitchen. Um, and the next day, Pamela Anderson popped up in a little square in her, what we call her roadhouse in Canada. And it was a two and a half hour conversation that just uh, unraveled everything I thought about her. And I just really, I really thought like, oh, if we could just bottle this one Zoom conversation up into a documentary film, it's surprising me right now. So I know it'll surprise, uh, it'll surprise an audience. And so that was sort of the, the very beginning. Um, before we, we get further into film, I was also curious about just your process in terms of starting new projects. Like, do, do you often get pitched on new projects? Do you generate them all your in-house? Like, what's the balance like there for you? Like half of my ideas have come from my mom. So <laughs> um, I don't, it's been a while since we've generated our own project. We, my producing partner is my, is my best friend since we were little kids. And so um, I think the last project that, uh, we just found the story ourselves was The Keepers, which was, uh, you know, a Netflix true crime series about the murder of a nun. Um, but that was a family story. That nun had been my aunt's teacher, um, you know, and that show was very early in the kind of streamer documentary boom, definitely in the true crime boom. It was it was Netflix's follow up to making a murderer. Uh, so it felt like the entire country watch that series, which was, you know, previously had just been this little family story. Uh, but now, I mean, we get pitched documentaries all day long. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing and it's a curse because we end up saying no to 99% of the things that are pitched to us just because we don't have the time. Like Jess and I only want to make two things maximum. Sometimes we've made three at the same time. Um, but we don't aspire to have a huge production company. Um, and so unfortunately, you know, I do a lot of forwarding to my friends and colleagues saying like, I think this would be a great fit for you um, because we can only, you know, our bandwidth is one or two, one or two films at a time. So when you're starting with, uh, with this film, where did you start in terms of how it would be structured? Did you you obviously had access to her and you were going to do interviews, but like, what did you think the film would look like? How did you start to kind of feel out what it ultimately became? Yeah, I mean, I actually don't even call them interviews in most of my films. I would say I've done a few interview-based films, but Pamela, I would say, you know, I'd say it's just gonna be you and me having conversations. And it's funny, like, I like to get there as fast as possible once, you know, I don't like to do a lot of planning. I'm a, I'm a pretty run and gun um, filmmaker and I like to get there as fast as possible once um, an idea is hatched and so actually when I watch Pamela uh, back you know like that that sort of master interview which is just Pamela you know in a white nightgown on a white couch there's no lights that's all natural light there's no hair and makeup it's a crew of four people in that room that was literally our first day of shoot days the first well I met her the night before in person she had us she had me and Jess over for dinner. Um, and the next morning we got there at 7.30. We said, we'll meet you in the beach house, which is on the water. She lives in the roadhouse, which is a little up the hill. And I could just see her out the window shuffling down and her with her bare feet and her nightgown. And she just kind of, I said, start rolling. Um, and so we started rolling and she just opened up the door, shuffled in, plopped on the couch. And it was so natural and real. And uh, she wasn't, you know, she didn't care. She didn't care that we didn't have this massive production value, which I had talked to her about 
I said, like, I'm probably not the right fit if you want a big, overly produced film. And she said, like, oh, I hate watching stuff like that. Like, do it as bare bones as you want to. And so she plopped down on that couch and we just started talking. And that became like the master interview. So anytime I would go back to Canada, it would be she would always change what kind of white nightgown she was wearing. Um, and she would change, you know, some she did zero hair and makeup, some she did very minimal. So she would change that up a little bit. And I would never ask her to change that because it's Pamela Anderson. I was like, however, she decides to sit on that couch is is what the audience is going to get for, for that day of conversations. And it became what we did over the course of the year. We would call it the white couch interview and she would just uh, come and sit down. The archive, like Brandon, her son had talked this big game because I think he was trying to sell me on making the documentary. Like, oh, my family has this huge archive. Like you, it's going to be so amazing when you see it. And then I talked to Pamela on the Zoom and she's like, oh, no, 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 I have nothing. I'm so sorry. I have not kept anything. So I was like, oh God, what are we going to use as the as the visual building blocks of this film if she, if it's you know only paparazzi footage and Baywatch and you know modeling photos of Pamela? Um, but she opened up. There's a loft in her beach house, and you have to like put up a ladder and go up there. And she opened it up, and she hadn't been up there ever. Uh, you know, like the people that work at her house had put boxes up there. And so Jess and I went up there and we started opening up these boxes and we were like, man, this looks like a lot of tapes and a lot of diaries. And so we went to the local pawn shop in her town and bought a TV and VCR because they were mostly VHS tapes and just brought it down to the ground floor of the uh, of the beach house. And that's why that's like a major scene in the film. That wasn't even supposed to be us filming Pamela. That was just me and my producing team needing a way to pop these tapes in and watch it uh, to know because, you know, she lives on an island. It's hard to bring that stuff back to Los Angeles. Uh, and so we just started watching stuff as fast as possible. And then Pamela would wander in and she was just curious. So she would just start popping in tapes. And I would say to my team, like, roll on it, roll on it. She's just reacting to this footage, watching it for the first time. And so between those conversations on the white couch and then all of this amazing archival that she had kept, especially um, of her marriage with Tommy, which we know um, the public at large is so interested in, um, and so many magical moments that we were finding in this footage, those became the two major components um, of the film. Um, you know, not knowing, which we'll get to later, I'm sure, not knowing at all that the film was gonna have like a crazy third act that none of us were expecting that would involve the Hulu series and getting a role in Chicago and another divorce. That was all, that was not a glimmer in our eye when we began this film. Um, with the interviews, um, so you have this kind of master interview and then you came back again and again. Uh, like, I, she's obviously so kind of disarmingly open and funny and, and like very vulnerable. What was your process like? Like, were there things ever that you kind of established were off the table in terms of topics? Were there moments where you're getting into heavier material and you would just kind of take more breaks? Like, what were those interviews like in terms of sometimes really difficult topics? Yeah, they were they were figuring out as we go. I mean, um, I've made I've made quite a do, few difficult films about sexual trauma. Um, and Pamela had watched those before, like she had watched The Keepers and, and Dr. Ruth obviously focuses a lot on sexuality. Uh, so Pamela, I think part of the reason, and I, I don't, I, I hate ever speaking for Pamela, but I was with her a couple nights ago on a panel and she said part of the reason um, she was comfortable working with me as a director is because she had watched my previous films and felt like sexual trauma had been treated with sensitivity. Um, and so uh, she was... She was very, very, you know, I would love to pump up this big game about how I, I spent months winning the trust of Pamela Anderson. Like that moment she plopped on that white couch for the first time, she was raw and vulnerable. I mean, that's her by nature. As long as, you know, it's hard to get her to say yes. She says no, no, no to almost everything. But once she's committed, she is like all in. Um and so literally nothing was off limits still to this day. I mean, even journalists, when I hear them um, talk to her, I don't think Pamela, she doesn't come with that team of publicists saying like, you can't ask this, you can't ask that. She doesn't, it's not the way her brain thinks. And so nothing was off limits, but that doesn't mean 
things weren't incredibly heavy. So it was figuring out as we went, there were no guardrails, but when, when we would go down um, certain paths of conversation, a lot that had to do with the trauma of her parents that was um, inflicted upon her and the abuse that happened when she was young. And then especially what we call the stolen tape, we don't call it the sex tape because it was never intended to be a sex tape. Uh, but the tapes that were stolen from her home and what it was like for her to go through that process, that would get very, very uncomfortable um, for her. I would have thought Pamela Anderson was like the type to have been through a ton of therapy and have talked this out throughout her life. Um, and she hasn't been like her, her form of therapy has been her journaling on those yellow legal pads. So it's all mostly stayed up here. Like even the people around her didn't know what she thought of these moments or how, how they had affected her life. Uh, so a lot of these things, I think she was talking about for the first time, even though she had written a lot about them. And so we would take a lot of breaks. I think there's a couple in the film. In fact, we had to do a, a version of our film where we scaled back showing how many times, you know, we had like one too many of them. I think we have two that we finally show in the film where she's like, I think it's the part where she's watching the tape with Tommy and she leaves with Brandon because it comes too much. And one part about the stolen tape. But a lot of times Pamela knows her boundaries and she would say like, I'm not, you know, and she she viscerally reacts to things. So she would say, I'm not, start, I'm starting not to feel well. Uh, and I would say, let's, let's cut, let's go take a lunch or like you and I go take a walk. Uh, and so it was a lot of taking breaks. They were never really like mega long sessions, you know, they would be like two hours here, two hours there, um, and then long breaks. And sometimes we would end for the day. Uh, like often it would just be like, I feel like she's had enough. Um, and Pamela likes to spend a lot of time alone. Um, she's not a big extrovert. And so she would kind of wander off with, well, al alone with her dogs. Like she would kind of wander off and I would say to my crew, like it was, it was tough because we were flying to an island. So we didn't have a, like, we wanted to maximize our time there, but I would say like, I think we should call it a day. I'm just feeling like, and she might call in the evening and say, I'm going to mow the lawn. Do you want to come over? and shoot it. We would drive back from our, there was like one, only one hotel in the town that had a, had a water slide in the gym. Uh, so we didn't have much to do there anyway. So we would just drive back um, and film. So it was about being very nimble and kind of following, following her lead as far as what, whatever that comfort level was on, on each shoot. I love the sight of her mowing the lawn. It uh, It's <laughs> such a great contrast to the kind of image that was formed in my mind uh, in the 90s. Um, so you, you mentioned this, uh, the archival material, and I have to imagine that being shown this like trove of, of personal home, of home videos is like a documentarian's dream. Um, but, but what was the process of just like managing that like I'm sure it was like a lot of tape in addition to like all of the journals as well. Like, how did you kind of contend with that and shape it into what you wanted to put on screen? Well, the first the first step was the tapes, because obviously, like you said, that is a documentary filmmaker's dream. And I'm not I'm not typically an archival documentary filmmaker. I'm much more verite run and gun. And so, you know, I've seen a lot of my friends and colleagues films that are that that are that urban legend of, of happening upon a trove of footage. And some of the best documentaries ever are versions of that story of, 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 of finding this cache of footage. Uh, and this was that urban legend for me. I'd never made a film where you happen upon something like that. And so the first step was watching down all the footage. The diaries weren't even something I knew about yet. You just start, I just started seeing a lot of paperwork throughout her house. Uh, and so we watched as many tapes as possible. The first trip, uh, Brandon, her son, um, came with us. So that was the only shoot he came on, which was key, I realize now, because she was still getting to know us. And this was so vulnerable for her, having, having those tapes literally stolen from her. And in her mind, that ruined her career and a lot of her personal life. Uh, so to be to hand them over, even though she didn't really know what was on them or what existed, but to like physically hand them over, um, to somebody else, you could tell grieved her. She was not, she was not having an easy time with it. And so it was Brandon who was like our drug mule. Like we, Brandon took it in two carry on suitcases himself and he left early. And so it was under the stewardship of her son that took back the first tapes. And we, 
very haphazardly had just watched because there were way too many to take back in two carry-ons. So we were just popping them in like crazy being like, this looks like a great one. This looks like a great one. This one just looks like static, throw it, throw it a corner. This one just looks like the kids, you know, the toddlers playing, throw it in the, throw it in the corner. Oh, wow. Here's her wedding to Kid Rock. So it was not methodical at all. And Brandon brought back two suitcases full that he carried himself, um, you know, and, and didn't check them obviously. And then, you know, we built up that trust over time. And so we could more methodically, every time we visited Canada, go through her tapes. And we ended up having so many besides those two suitcases that we wanted to bring home. Um, and this included the diaries because she has like, I mean, she has safes and safes that are just full of diaries. Uh, and she said, take whatever you want. Like she she had never reread them. So she was saying like, you're welcome to take them if if you want them. I have no idea what's in them. We had so much stuff that we ended up renting a cargo van and Dominique Hessard Owens, who's one of my associate producers, she, we flew her husband up so that they could do a road trip together. And they road trip down from Vancouver Island all the way to Los Angeles. I think it took them five or six days in a cargo van full, of, I think it was like nine crates full of Pamela Anderson's stuff. And it was, you know, it's sensitive stuff. Obviously, it's very valuable. People made, you know, tens of millions of dollars off this stuff on the internet. And so, you know, Pam, I mean, uh, Dominique and her husband had like a system for checking in the boxes to whatever hotel they were staying in each night and then checking the boxes back out into the cargo van um, to make sure nothing got left behind. Um, and so we treated it very seriously. The footage and diaries, the entire time we were making the film, we're in like a padlocked room with double security to make sure, um, you you know, you had to have complete permission to even get to get eyes on it. And so we were keeping Pamela um, abreast of these things so that she felt like her stuff was safe um, because that safety um, had been stolen from her um, in the 90s. Um, and then the diaries, you know, Dominique, the the associate producer, she she read literally every diary that Pamela Anderson has ever written and then had to transcribe them because, you know, we can't, as filmmakers, we needed to, to start paper scripting them. We need to see them. We need to have them digitally. Um, and actually it's Dominique that, uh, Dominique was the scratch narration. So she would read them for our editor um, and then they would go in a scratch narration. And in the end, when Pamela decided she didn't want to read them, um, she and Brandon heard Dominique reading them. And Dominique has this like Pamela-esque voice just by coincidence. Um, like our diary expert associate producer has this really feathery light voice. And Pamela and Brandon said, like, why don't you just have her read them for the final film? So we actually, that's, that's not even a voiceover actor. It's just Dominique, the associate producer, who was the steward of the diaries from the beginning, who, who plays the voice of Pamela. Because as Pamela and Brandon said, like, no one knows my inner thoughts more than this woman, Dominique, who read every diary. So let's just have her read them. Uh, you've mentioned the the third act of the film, and you do have this incredible flurry of of kind of action of of not just like things happening, but also things that tie into all of the themes of the film that has come before the the Pam and Tommy series, uh, which was not authorized by her, and you have her getting invited to go on to uh, to join uh, Chicago on Broadway. You have her divorce. Um, what was it like to have all of those things suddenly going on and and how did you find your ending I it was chaotic uh but I I'm like a filmmaker who embraces chaos I love chaos because I'm pretty chaotic so uh that's probably why I'm very comfortable in run and gun type of situations or or stories versus much more planned out ones. So Pamela and I were a good match in that type of way where I like just like jumping on a plane with my camera and beelining it to a place. Or, you know, there's, there's a scene in the film, it was much longer at some point where Pamela and her assistant, Jonathan, are road tripping um, from Canada down to California. It's right after she went through uh, her divorce and she needed to just get out of Canada uh, as she said, do you want to come? So I, I'm in the back of that red truck with them um, for a few days as they drive down the country with her golden retriever sitting on my lap, just filming Jonathan and Pamela doing this like escape from Canada 
road trip. So I thrived in that chaos. I know, I know Pamela very, very well now. You know, we're pretty close at this point. Um, but at the beginning of my film, I thought like, oh, what a tidy three-act structure. This small town island girl who moved to the US, lived this crazy wild life, and now has returned to the island to live out the rest of her years, married a local, what, what beautiful bookends, um, and thought we had this tidy little narrative. And now I know Pamela well enough to know like nothing is tidy in Pamela's life. The moment something starts feeling tidy, Pamela will blow it up. Uh, and, and, you know, that's not always by her own doing, like the Hulu series was totally out of her control, but the divorce and taking the role in Chicago were her choices. Uh, and so all three of those things were happening at the same time. And I should say the divorce you know, I went, I went to Canada on the first shoot with that notion. I'm like, oh, how beautiful. She married a local. Like, this is going to be so fun to film from the, like, you know, documentary 101, at least when I was learning documentaries 25 years ago in college was like, never, never affect your story. Like your job is to be a total fly on the wall and your, your participation in this should not impact the trajectory of where the story is going. This was not like that at all. From the moment I showed up, um, and especially once she started watching this archival footage with Tommy, she was spiraling. Um, and she was like pulling me aside, you know, when we would walk around corners being like, grabbing me like, what am I doing here? Like, I've made a huge mistake because she had been there for a year during COVID by that point. Like, I'm going crazy. So she, she was reeling. Um, and the mere fact that we were making a documentary and act, asking her to excavate, you know, what she sees some of the best years of her life and the worst years were causing turmoil in her. And like, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not meant to come back here and just die. Like, I don't know what the next chapter for me, for me is, but it's not staying in Canada on my parents' land, married to a local. And so it was kind of like a hurricane from the beginning. And so we had to just be very nimble in that sense of being willing to follow that hurricane wherever it went. Um, and I mean, we couldn't have asked for a more perfect way to wrap that up than Chicago, because like you said, it touched on a lot of the themes. Like the Hulu series was, was churning up all of this terrible all of the, these terrible memories for her and Hulu, I mean, uh, and Chicago gave her, gave her the potential of redemption. Like she would never say that out loud while we were doing it, but it was like, this allows me to take, take my career by the reins in a way like I feel like is not happening right now and prove something to people. Um, uh, and so, I mean, and by the way, we were, she too, we were terrified that she couldn't pull it off. Like I remember, cause I cared a lot about her by that point. And I remember saying to her, it might even be in our film, like, do you know how to sing and dance? Like hoping she would say, yeah, like I've been doing that since I was a little girl or like I'm classically trained. And she like burst into laughter and she's like, no, like Dylan used to ask me to stop singing lullabies to him when he was a toddler. Cause he didn't like my voice. Like, I have no idea how to sing and dance. I was on Dancing with the Stars once. Um, and so I was so afraid for her that it was gonna be like a public humiliation in some way, but also really admiring that type of bravery that like, I don't have that in me. Um, I know I don't have that in me. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people do. And so it allowed this redemptive, arc that we weren't forcing that she was taking on her own terms success or failure that we could watch I mean we could make a whole film about the training for Chicago up to leading night we filmed so much of that stuff and it was so fun um so fun to film and it just got majorly trimmed down because you can't do that once you're 90 minutes into a film um but it was a hurricane at the end. Um, and we were just kind of, she she never said stop filming um, any of that. The divorce, the Hulu series, Chicago, she allowed us to film it all. And, um, you know, I don't think we could have asked for a better, a better third act to wrap up all of those themes. Um, were there any, I'm sure a lot of stuff has had to 
end up on the cutting room floor that you were thrilled to have gotten at the time, but there's anything in particular that you're like, ah, oh, that was hard to let go of. A lot, a lot. I mean, we, I, as you've seen since you've watched the film, like at some point you have to decide what your film is about, right? And I felt like my film was about uh, the most romantic woman in the world. It was about love. It was a lot about sexuality and how that was taken from her in many ways and how she took it back um, in many ways that was surprising. And then in that, you have to decide what your film's not about. And I had to be okay. And I really have to thank Netflix for supporting that vision. Um, I had to be okay with sacrificing a lot of the, the, the sexy stuff, like the more celebrity driven stuff or the more famous Hollywood stuff. Cause Pamela, I mean, Pamela has stories for days and I recommend anyone that liked the documentary read her memoir, which came out the same day. Cause you know, I think the, the memoirs audiobook is like six hours long. My documentary is only a hundred minutes long. You can, you can't fit in a documentary what you can in a book, especially when you want the archival to be such a part of the fabric of the documentary and you want to let it breathe. So you don't want it to be wall to wall storytelling. Uh, so it was a lot of that, a lot of her marriage to Kid Rock, which is fascinating. A lot of her marriage to Rick. I mean, both those men are just like a nugget. There are a couple lines um, in our film. We had a whole section about home improvement, which was her first big acting role. We had a section of that, um, that, that story that made headlines out of her memoir of Tim Allen exposing him, himself to her on the set. I knew that that could grab headlines for our documentary, but it just didn't, it didn't fit in the narrative, the narrative that we were telling um, at some point. Um, some amazing stories, amazingly horrifying stories of what it was like to be that famous. Um, we had a scene of Pamela when she was a single mom coming into her house in Malibu. Um, where she goes upstairs and finds a woman in her bed, in her Baywatch bathing suit. She had taken out of the closet and was wearing it and had been, Pamela had been out of town. The woman had been living in her bedroom for days um, and she slit her wrists when Pamela found her. Um, that, was a, that, that was like a story in the news. So we had a whole section um, about how dark fame could be. A man who tried to kidnap Dylan um, from the playground and had like a shack in the woods with pictures of Pamela all around it, where Pamela, we called it our kindergarten cop scene, where Pamela basically had to hire a fake PE teacher at the kid's school uh, to watch them because someone had tried to kidnap Dylan. So a, a lot of amazing stories. They're all in her book that I just had to be okay with ending up on the cutting room floor because in the end, we thought our film is a character portrait and it's how romantically this woman sees the world. And sometimes a great story, no matter how great it is, just doesn't just doesn't support that character portrait. Before I let you go, um, has she seen the film? <laughs> that is a good, that is a good question. I know she never saw the film. She was not interested in the film while we were making it. What she would always say is like, I will do this under one condition. I never see it. Don't don't ask me questions about the making of it. That's why we include that sort of meta moment where I ask her to read her diaries in the film. And she's kind of counseling me saying, you don't want that, Ryan. Like, don't pull that curtain back for me in that way because it's going to backfire on you, which I, I always appreciated how self-aware Pamela was in those situations. So she would say, I'll make this film as long as I never see it and don't make it a sob story. Please don't make it a sob story. Um, those were her two conditions. Then our film started coming out and she started doing interviews and Brandon was texting me like, holy fuck, like she has no idea what's in the film. Like people are asking her questions about diaries from when she was in her twenties and she's clueless. So she doesn't know how to answer it. So he basically begged her to watch it. So we set up a screening at Netflix um, you know, Netflix was like, Ryan, do you want to come? And I was like, hell no. Like she has told, and that's always the worst part. I think of making a film is showing it to the person for the first time, no matter how much that person is going to love that film, you know, in three weeks or one year, or even the next day, they might love the film. The moment they watch the film for the first time, it's like, they are just shell shocked and it's never fun to be in that room. And especially Pamela who'd said, I don't want to watch the film. I did not want to be in the room. 
Brandon was like, hell no, I'm not going to be in the room with my mom. So poor Dylan, like the sweetest kid in the world, he hadn't seen it because he didn't work on the film. Brandon had watched cuts throughout. Netflix set up a screening for Pamela and Dylan to watch it together in a little screening room at Netflix. And so they watch it together. But, you know, it like, I mean, a lot of it's like, Playboy and um, you know Baywatch it so like Pamela said half the time she's like covering Dylan's eyes because it's her nude so she's she she took bathroom breaks like like while the film was still playing which is a filmmaker's nightmare like so she just left for certain parts I guess and came back so the way she words it she's half seen the film um, she tried a few weeks later while we were releasing the film she said she tried to watch it in a hotel room just alone um, and she started sobbing like 25 or 30 minutes in and she said she had to turn it off not in a you know in a in a, in a this is too triggering way um, so yeah she really still hasn't watched it in full she says maybe one day when she's an old lady she'll sit down and watch it um, in full but she's she always says like it's my life like I know what happened I don't need to re-watch it and that's just so, I mean, that's why I love Pamela Anderson. Like what kind of celebrity never watches their own documentary? That just sounds so contrived and unrealistic, but with her, that that's true. I mean, that's, that's genuine. She's not, she can't bring herself to watch it. Ryan, it was so great to get to talk to you. And uh, of course, Pamela Love Story streaming on Netflix. Thank you so much for taking the time, Allison. That was fun. Yeah, that was super fun. <laughs>